dear students in this class we are going to discuss a very important topic that is both important for the understanding of the subject as well as for the exam purpose also as you can see today we uh, we are going to discuss the determination of primary structure of protein so you have already uh, been taught about you have already know you have studied you have been this topic has been discussed that what are the different uh, levels of structures of a protein what is primary what is secondary tertiary etc uh, levels of structures of a protein so you by no by now obviously have an idea that the primary structure is the basic thing that forms the protein it is the amino acids the sequence of the amino acids that that is the main thing of the protein and on on that primary structure now the further folding the three dimensional foldings of secondary tertiary quaternary etc all these things now build upon the primary structure so this is the whatever a protein is its identity is the primary structure so if you want to study a protein if you want to know anything about a protein it is the primary structure that you have to determine so as you know the sequence of the protein is basically the primary structure is more or less the sequence of the protein so uh, loosely speaking so we also call this process as sequencing of a protein so the first protein that was sequenced was insulin insulin is the first protein that was sequenced and it was sequenced by one of the greatest biologist of all time that is frederick sanger we will hear his name again and again in many other topics in many other uh, issues also so uh, we will not go into that but we will directly go into the primary structure determination and as you know the primary structure is basically is the is the description of the number and composition and most importantly the sequence of amino acids so from n terminal to c terminal end uh, by convention what is the sequence of amino acids that is present that is mainly the primary structure and obviously if you know the sequence you anyway will know the number and composition of the amino acids so to determine the sequence of the amino acids first what we need to do this is not the step of primary structure determination but this is a prerequisite that we need to do because if you want to study a protein if you want to determine its primary structure at first you need to purify that protein because the protein you will always get in some biological sample say you are getting the protein from rbc or you are getting it from the liver tissue so what you do you have to there are many many proteins and many other molecules so first you need to purify the protein that you want to work with and there are various methods various steps through which we purify a protein like sorting out dialysis different chromatography and electrophoresis techniques these things will be somewhat discussed later on but through many steps involving these processes ultimately when you get a very pure form of the protein then only you can sequence it because if there is a uh, impurity there are other proteins mixed then your entire sequencing process will be very very erroneous so how can we approach this sequencing so at the beginning specifically how sanger did it the one thing we can do is at first we can determine the n terminal end of the peptide or the protein that we are trying to sequence so for n terminal determination the determination of the n terminal amino acid there are many reagents but most importantly there is sanger's reagent what is sanger's reagent sanger's reagent is this molecule that you can see this is fluorodinitro benzene one fluoro dinitro benzene which we can write as fd this is known as fdnb fluoro dinitro benzene or fdnb one fluoro two four dinitro benzene as you can see okay so this is also known as sanger's reagent this is fluoro dinitro benzene or sanger's reagent so how does it act you can see in this reaction you don't need to memorize the or entire reaction process but the basic concept you need to remember that the fdnb or the here we it has been written as dinitrofluorobenzene it is the same thing dnfb or fdnb so first you can see say this is the peptide from n terminal end the red one is the first amino acid blue one is the second amino acid and the green one is the third amino acid first amino acid second amino acid third amino acid like this and this continues so this is from the n terminal end okay so at first what happens at first this fdnb or dnfb 
this molecule will go and bind with the n terminal end here it will bind it will bind with the n terminal amino acid then we treat it with a strong acid as you can see a strong acid h plus ion we are treating with here it is written as h3o plus but basically it is h plus strong acid we are treating with so that as a result all the peptide bonds are broken so here you can see all the peptide bonds are broken and all amino acids are released as free amino acids except only the n terminal amino acid this one this is not released <coughs> sorry as the free amino acid but this is released as the derivative of amino acid with fdnb amino acid attached to fdnb that is being released all other amino acids are released as free amino acids only the amino acids so what will happen if we now run this through some particular identification process most commonly through some chromatography process a hplc process so now what we do we run this entire thing all these things we now run through a process known as hplc high performance liquid chromatography where we can identify each amino acid individually so whatever amino acids are coming out one by one we can identify as a particular amino acid only we will see one particular amino acid is not coming coming out as the amino acid itself but as the derivative of the amino acid with fdnb so we know that amino acid must be the n terminal amino acid so this is how with this reagent we determine the n terminal amino acid okay there are some other reagents also that can do the same thing in some other mechanism reactions or reaction mechanism but the same thing that determination of n terminal amino acid instead of sanger's reagent we can use dancyl chloride or dabsyl chloride so these are the three common reagents that we use to determine the n terminal amino acid similarly if you want to determine the c terminal amino acid there are two common reagents that we use one is hydrazine we are not going into the detail of the mechanism of reaction there but just know the name that hydrazine is one rea uh, reagent that can help determine the c terminal amino acid that is the opposite end there is another enzyme that is carboxypeptidase that cuts and release the carboxyl terminal end amino acid that also can be used for this purpose but as you can see in a very long amino acid chain uh, a very long peptide chain there will be many amino acids so just by knowing the n terminal and c terminal you cannot know the sequence so you only know the two ends although sanger used that method to one by one determine each amino acid shorten it etc but as you can see in this process once this rea re reaction is done the entire peptide is destroyed so you cannot work with other uh, uh, other amino acids so ideally what should have been the perfect type of reagent where you just release one amino acid from one end you get what that amino acid and the rest remains intact so one by one you can release them and identify them exactly same thing if you can do then you can know the entire sequence by one set of reagent and reactions so that is exactly what was done by per edman edman developed a reagent known as edman's reagent obviously which is phenyl isothiocyanate or in short form PITC so PITC or phenyl isothiocyanate is Edman's reagent this is an important question what is Sanger's reagent FDNB what is Edman's reagent that is PITC or phenyl isothiocyanate so it also reacts with the N terminal end like the Sanger's reagent but see what is the difference and why it is better so here the entire reaction is again you don't need to remember the structure just only the structure of PITC if you can know that is very good but otherwise entire this thing you don't need to memorize and draw as structures I will later show you a schematic diagram so just see what is happening so this is our protein here this is my protein this is the polypeptide long chain of polypeptide so see this PITC at first interacts with the again the N terminal amino so this is amino acid you can see this is amino acid 1 amino acid 2 amino acid 3 4 it is continuing so this is the N terminal amino acid to which my PITC first goes and binds just like the FDNB bound with the N terminal amino acid and it forms a derivative while the pep attached to the peptide that is known as phenyl thio 
कार्बामाइल डेरिवेटिव फिनाइल थायो कार्बामाइल डेरिवेटिव और पी टी सी डेरीवेटिव पी आई टी सी बाइंड विद द इंटरमिनल एंड एंड फॉर्म्स द पी आई टी सी डेरीवेटिव एंड देन वॉट हैपन्स द इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग इज नाउ वेन वी यूज एन एसिड हियर वी यूज अ वीक और माइल्ड एसिड इन द Sanger's reagent, we had to use a strong acid, so all the peptide bonds were broken. But here we use a mild acid. So interestingly, here only this peptide bond gets broken. This one, this bond is only broken. So only the first amino acid goes out as a derivative, which finally becomes a phenyl thio hydantoin derivative or PTH derivative. through some intermediate steps that you may forget you don't need to remember this intermediate step but finally it forms the pth or phenyl thio hydantoin derivative but what happens to the rest of the polypeptide chain it remains intact only shortened by one amino acid so the amino acid one or the n terminal amino acid is now going out or released as the pth derivative and the rest of the peptide remains intact only shortened by one amino acid so now the amino acid 2 this amino acid the amino acid 2 is now the n terminal amino acid so what we can do we can now repeat this process again you treat it with another round of phenyl isothiocyanate pitc again it binds to the second amino acid which is now the new n terminal amino acid again it is released as the pth derivative and as with each cycle of reaction one after the next amino acids are released from the n terminal end as their corresponding pth derivative so say your peptide at its n terminal end has alanine so at first the first amino acid alanine goes out as the pth derivative of alanine and then you identify that derivative through different processes like hplc as we said then you do the reaction again a second cycle and now your second amino acid say which was uh, for example glutamate so that second amino acid now will be the n terminal new n terminal that will again do the same reaction and will next be released as the pth derivative of glutamate so now again through hplc or some other process you identify it as glutamate then again the third amino acid now becomes the new n terminal and like this you keep on moving from n terminal determining one amino acid after another and this process is known also as edman degradation so this is a degradation process one after another so this process is known as edman degradation so this is known as edman degradation so edman degradation process and this is a sequencing process not like the n terminal or c terminal determination where you only get one amino acid here you get the sequence in a sequential manner from n terminal end towards the c terminal end direction this is known as edman de degradation or protein sequencing so you do the same reaction cycle after cycle round after round and the peptide gets shortened one amino acid at a time and you determine them so if we see this diagram you can easily draw so this is how the thing happens so say this is my uh, peptide chain so from n terminal we have alanine glycine phenylalanine aspartate asparagine and this may continue so at first what happens this is say this is my edmans reagent this one is the edmans reagent that is pitc it comes and binds with the alanine here it forms the ptc or phenyl thio carbamoyl derivative and then you treat with mild acid and this bond only gets broken so this alanine goes out as the phenyl thio hydantoin or pth derivative of alanine so you can then identify it as a derivative of alanine through a process like hplc and then the rest of the polypeptide does not break down unlike the sanger's reagent again i am repeating the same thing here the rest here the rest of the peptide chain remains intact only it is shortened by one amino acid now your second amino acid becomes the new n terminal so this glycine which was the second amino acid this now becomes the new n terminal so again you do the same reaction edman binds here and this is released so you identify the second amino acid now as the derivative of glycine so obviously the second amino acid has to be glycine so what happens now the amino acid the peptide chain is further shortened and the third amino acid now becomes the new n terminal amino acid. so like this you can keep on doing this cycle and you can determine amino acid one after the other from the n terminal to the c terminal end
Now this is fantastic. You can just sequence the entire polypeptide chain like this. But obviously, like any process, like any things in life, this also have some uh, limitations. So what is the limitation? The most important limitation is you can do this cycling and this process only up to a certain limit. If the chain is very long beyond certain length, the amount of error will be too high. So the accuracy of the process, obviously, the thing that we have seen, there will be some errors. So until the length chain length of 30, 40 amino acids, it is OK. You can just keep on doing this round after round and you can just sequence one amino acid after another from N terminal end. But whenever the chain length is more than 30 to 40 uh, amino acid or longer than 30 to 40 amino acids, then it becomes much less accurate and it becomes then unacceptable. So what we do then? If a polypeptide, there are many polypeptides, many proteins which are much larger than 30, 40 amino acids. So what do we do then? So what we do then is we cleave it into short pieces. So we break down the long polypeptide chain into smaller pieces and then we individually sequence all these small pieces. Okay. So what are the usually usual reagents through which we cleave these peptides? Some are enzymatic reagents like chymotrypsin and trypsin. They cleave the polypeptide at some specific region. So chymotrypsin will cleave at the carboxyl side of aromatic amino acids. So in the entire polypeptide chain, anywhere it finds aromatic amino acids, like you know the aromatic amino acids are, that is phenylalanine, tyrosine and tryptophan. Whenever it finds any such aromatic amino acids on the carboxyl side, on the C side of that aromatic amino acid inside the chain, whenever it finds, it will cleave. So if there are in the polypeptide, say it is a 100, polypep 100 amino acid long polypeptide chain, if there are 8 aromatic amino acids, so it will cut on the carboxyl side of each of those 8. So you will get 9 small pieces from that long polypeptide. Similarly, trypsin will cleave at carboxyl side of any basic amino acid it finds. You know basic amino acids are lysine, arginine and histine. So whenever it finds a basic amino acids, it will cleave at the carboxyl end of that. So these are the two enzymatic reagents. So these are the two enzymatic reagents. Two en reagents are enzymatic reagents for cleavage of the peptide. And then there is a chemical reagent that is cyanogen bromide. It cleaves again at a specific region that is carboxyl side of methionine. Whenever it finds methionine at the carboxyl end, it will cleave the peptide. So you can use these different reagents to cleave the peptide and then you get smaller pieces less than 30 40 amino acid long and you can through edman degradation process now can sequence each one of them now you have a new question how to arrange those fragments so now you have say for example you have a long polypeptide chain you have cleaved it at four or five places so now you have different fragments like a b c d e f and you individually sequence all of them A, B, C, D, E, F. Individually you sequence all of them. But after you have cleaved, how do you know what is the sequence of the fragments? So A, then B, then C, D, E, F. Or at first B, then A, then D, then C, then E, then F. How do you know what is the sequence of these fragments? So individual fragment you know what is the sequence. So here what we do, we take the same polypeptide chain two or three different sets each set we cleave with different cleaving reagents and then we try to match and overlap the sequence of each one of them so what we do is like this so say this is my polypeptide chain say this one threonine phenylalanine valine lysine alanine alanine trypsin uh, tryptophan glycine and lysine so what we do at first we cleave it with one set that is the uh, say with trypsin so trypsin will cleave where there is the basic amino acid say here there is lysine so here at lysine it will cut this will cut here in this region in this region it will cut so you will get two fragments what are the two fragments one is threonine phenylalanine valine lysine another is alanine alanine uh, tryptophan glycine and lysine so how do you know this one is first and this is second or this one is first this one is second so you take the same polypeptide another full polypeptide another set of reagent and then you cut it with 
cut it with the another reagent that is chymotrypsin so you know chymotrypsin will cut at the carboxyl side of the uh, aromatic amino acid so here phenylalanine aromatic amino acid so chymotrypsin this one will cut here at the phenylalanine and will cut here at the tryptophan so now you get segment like this one this one this one so now you compare this sequence this sequence with this this and this sequence so by comparing and how do they overlap with each other by that comparison now you can easily understand that which fragment will come after which fragment so like in this way the entire long polypeptide can also be sequenced so this in short is the process how we sequence a polypeptide that is the determination of the primary structure but one thing is still left that you know primary structure is also a description of the covalent bonds the higher order structures are only formed through the non covalent bonds so there is any covalent bond between amino acids that has to be described described inside the primary structure description so obviously here we are describing the peptide bonds sequentially what are the peptide bonds between different amino acids but there is another kind of covalent bond that can be formed that is disulfide bonds so we need to determine the positions of disulfide bonds also if there is any in some many polypeptides not in all but in many polypeptides and proteins you will you know that between the cysteine residue some of the specific cysteine residue one with another they can form the cysteine as you know cysteine has a free sh group so two cysteine groups between their sh groups they can join together two cysteines here is one cysteine here is one cysteine so they together can form they together can be joined through a ss or disulfide bond so how do we determine how many disulfide bonds are there and what are their positions so for that what we do we do it in a step wise manner what we do at first we reduce the disulfide bonds so for reducing the disulfide bonds we have two reducing reagents commonly used one is the dithiothretol and the second one is beta mercaptoethanol dithiothretol and beta mercaptoethanol we can use any one of them so by using them we reduce the disulfide bonds okay so now we take two sets of the protein in one set we reduce the disulfide bond and in another set we do not reduce the disulfide bonds and then we cleave them into pieces in both set so we cleave into pieces in one set with the disulfide bonds intact where they are not broken and then in another set again we cleave into pieces where the disulfide bonds are reduced and in both cases we sequence them separately so obviously where the disulfide bonds are present the fragment pattern will be different because two fragments will be attached to each other and where the disulfide bonds are reduced there the fragment patterns will be different and then we can compare between them and then determine the position exact position of the disulfide bonds this comparison and uh, uh, and then overlapping and determination is a complicated process and often this is done by different software models anyway but this can be done and this is how the determination of disulfide bonds are done so the entire polypeptide the primary structure that we know that is the sequence of the amino acids we can do mainly by the edman degradation for a longer polypeptide more than 30 40 amino acid we cleave it into different pieces using different re different reagents forming different fragments and individually sequencing all the fragments then comparing with, with between the fragments of one set of cleavage with another set of cleavage and then we can compare and then arrange them in a particular order to get the entire sequence of the polypeptide and for determination of disulfide bonds we reduce them and then we compare with the unreduced fragments okay now finally there are some modern techniques these techniques are also modern we can do them but there are some more accurate and much better techniques that have been discovered now and in Uh, state of the art labs now where the they work with proteins the proteomic labs of the highest uh, quality there they have some state of the art methods the modern techniques that can more accurately much better in a much better way they can determine the protein structure we will not go into the detail of those methods just you can know the names of them so one is tandem mass spectrometry tandem mass spectrometry is a special type of mass spectrometry where where we break a long a uh, polymer of things into one by one into monomers and then determine each uh, unit one by one 
through mass spectrometry so we are not going into that detail but just know tandem mass spectrometry is a method by which we can determine the sequence and then the second one that is the sequencing of the cdna or the complementary dna so what we do instead of sequencing the protein if we can separate the mrna for the protein and then from the mrna we can form a complementary dna mrna you know in mrna there is exact information is written in the form of genetic codes one after the another each signifying one amino acid so if you know the sequence of mrna then you exactly know what should be the sequence of the protein that is formed from the mrna the mature mrna but to um, mrnas and rnas as a whole are much uh, uh, unstable molecule they break down very easily it is very difficult to work with them so what we do we convert it to a complementary dna from mrna we just convert it to its corresponding complementary dna structure through some specific reverse transcriptase enzyme so that complementary dna or cdna then we can sequence and from that sequence we can again we know what are the subsequent all the uh, one after the another what are the uh, genetic codes and from that we can know what is the what are the amino acid sequence of the protein that will be formed from it so you can ask that why not directly determine the protein sequence instead of determining so going it uh, round and round and do it in a more complicated way the reason is it is much easier the process of determining the sequence of a dna has been developed in such a manner that it is much easier and much more accurate method to determine the sequence of a dna than to determine the sequence of a protein and also what i said at the very beginning to determine the sequence of a protein you has to you have to purify the protein which is a very very difficult time taking and very complicated process so instead if we can get the mrna of that protein so there is a big if you have to first get the mrna of the protein if you can do that then you can convert it to complementary dna and then sequence the complementary dna and from that you can very well get the sequence of the protein thank you so these are the things that we need to know about this topic but this is a very important topic as i said at the beginning so please go through it after you listen to this class thank you